So good morning to everyone. Welcome to the CSR um, International Conference Center. Um, this particular session um, deals with futures thinking. Um, with me today, I have Tanya Eichert, um, who's a um, qualified and highly experienced futures and foresight practitioner um, who specializes in applied systems thinking, scenario planning, horizon scanning, strategic foresight, uh, risk management, and facilitating strategic conversations. Um, she helps provide clarity and direction for organizations and institutions faced with complexity and uncertainty. So today, um, Tanya will be talking to us about looking out for weak signals and pockets of the future in, uh, I assume that's in the present, uh, how to do emerging issues analysis and why it matters. Uh, I'd like to welcome Tanya, thank you. Um, oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I mean, gosh, you're supposed to do that after, afterwards if I was okay. Um, uh, hello, good morning. It's wonderful to be here. Um, we're a fairly smallish audience because this session competed with the tours, I gather. Um, and because we're a small session, I would like to invite us to be interactive. So by all means, please... Um, you know, interrupt me, just, you've, you've all got a little speakerphone thing in front of you. So if there's something in the slides, the plan is to go through the slide deck, these will be available afterwards, and then spend nearly half the time that we are together engaging in some kind of conversation. Um, because I have a feeling, if this might sound a little bit preachy, I might be preaching to the converted. Duarte, that's certainly the case with you. Um, but there might also just be interesting things that, that you relate to, or that you would like to um, engage with. Um, so the fact that we're not a huge audience um, is actually quite nice if we want to spend a little bit more time in conversation. So let me get going. I've, um, on my title screen here, I've also, I must just do a little bit of marketing, um, put there that at Stellenbosch University, where I'm a fellow at Center for Sustainability Transitions, um, has now been awarded a UNESCO chair in complex systems and transformative African futures. Um, so the kind of the futures work that I'm doing wearing my academic hat um, is, is literally looking that sort of one step further than the regular strategic foresight or the forecasting work that you would have heard of yesterday from Yaki and sort of looking more in terms of phase transition. And, and I'll speak a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so, so why? Why do we even bother? Um, looking at futures and they, they don't even exist, and then one step further looking at weak signals, things that might represent or signal a future or futures that do not exist. Why? Um, there's the reason. The acronym is, is VUCA, Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. It's a U.S. Army acronym, so in some circles it's a little bit politically um, unpopular, then if you want to, you can use the Oxford acronym, which is TUNA, Turbulent, Uncertain, um, oh gosh, no, I can't remember the Oxford one. Anyway, very similar. But the point is systems interacting with one another in where we are now and what gets created from the interaction of those systems have become so unpredictable that one needs different ways of working. And volatility is not just about things are volatile, it's also the speed with which they happen. So a trend is a trend until it bends. And calling the bend is, is the really difficult bit and nearly impossible. So uncertainties becoming non-predictable. Complexity, essentially the rule of thumb um, and my co-chair at Stellenbosch University is a, is a, a complexity expert, uh, nearly anything that's got human activities and systems embedded in it is essentially a, a complex system and not a complicated system. And then, of course, ambiguity. ambiguity. The different things mean different, different, different things mean different things to different people, and, and that all in, engages. So here's the evidence. I mean, this is not just me saying this, a prediction becomes useless or sometimes more dangerously misleading in this VUCA world. 
And here we like to refer to the work of Nassim Taleb, the author of Black Swan, um, and he, who just said it's impossible. You know, those risk, the risk forecasting um, in the finance world, people thought they knew what they were doing, and this wasn't the case at all. Um, Philip Tetlock, and he's been running this wonderful program with super forecasters, has empirically proven that foreign affairs experts are less accurate. As a matter of fact, they were about as accurate as random. And random in this case means a chimpanzee throwing a dart against a wall. And, and then, of course, this bias thing comes in. So the more sure and certain the foreign affairs experts were about how geopolitical events might unfold, the more wrong they were looking at hindsight. And Philip Tetlock has started this wonderful program that the, U, the British military and I know the US military are working with now about super forecasters, regular people who have capabilities um, and then they get trained as well. And it has to do in the way in which they are thinking. And they tend to be a lot better at calling events. And then of course, Daniel Kahneman, he's the father of behavioral economics and he got the Nobel Prize, I can see nodding here. Um, that wonderful, wonderful work that he did where he revealed how we get, we are systematically misguided about the future and about a whole lot of decisions we make about really, really important things in life. And it has to do with how our brains work. So this, this difference between thinking fast and thinking slow. And the brain is essentially an energy chomping machine that if it can, likes to think fast and take immediate. So one has to, again, be conscious, be trained, be aware of doing slow thinking where you start taking better decisions. So um, I never, oh gosh, he's bleeding off the page, poor old Einstein, um, <laughs> the, the font. Um, he says, it, the quote is ascribed to him, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So what are some of these kinds of new different ways of thinking? Well, I'm going to argue futures thinking is, is one of them. There are a couple of others. Complexity thinking, taking a systems approach to complex problems, wicked problems, intractable issues, um, so things like big data analytics. There's a whole lot of different ways of working that we need to get a lot better at. Um, so future studies, a little bit of a definition there also interchangeably called strategic foresight, an interdisciplinary collection of methods, theories, and findings that help people think constructively about the future. So it's structured, it's systematic. It's not just let's all get together and do a vision um, and then you know, you're sort of doing futures thinking. The rigorous art of imagining, and, and I really, really have to do, I have to emphasize, Duarte, and this is arguable, is that it's craft, not science, okay? And I, I, have a, I have a previous life in doing quantitative data forecasting and planning work, um, and nowadays all of it is qualitative, and it's a craft, okay? Um, and then essentially the use of the future to make better decisions today. So, so developing a capability to use the future in inverted commas. Um, to be able to actively, in a structured manner, explore what might happen so that you can take better decisions, make better choices now. Now, um, that lovely little sort of figure showing um, it's based on the futures cone, um, which is some of the academia around this, is, and, and, and the picture here is of a flashlight. And it's a nice way of imagining it, that if you're stumbling around in the dark and you have a flashlight, and it shines just that little bit further and it gives you some better decision-making ability. Now, the middle of the flashlight is going to shine a little bit brighter. We tend to want to look there, and that's kind of probable futures or business as usual if nothing changes. And for that, you use time series analysis, forecasting work, that sort of thing. But then the edges of the flashlight are slightly more blurry, and that's when you start having the sort of different futures, preferable futures, plausible futures. Um, and I'm adding into the mix there, it's not on the picture, preposterous futures. Extremely important that we should be working about looking at preposterous futures. That's the bit, so it's, this is crazy stuff, it's never gonna happen, okay? We're actively working with that as well. And the super example of that always is in the, the late 1800s, Jules Verne, a French author, science fiction author, was writing about putting a man in a rocket and sending him off to the moon. That was a preposterous future. Okay, this unimaginable, crazy stuff. But then, of course, as time progresses, in the Second World War, the Nazis built these V2 powerful rockets, it starts becoming plausible, okay? 
And then after the war in the Manhattan Project um, and the money that was poured into it, it starts becoming a preferable future and a probable future. And John F. Kennedy that stands up and said, we will put a man on the moon before the end of the decade, not because it's, because it's hard to do something. And that then starts making the future that was preposterous, depending on how far along. So the reason I'm telling you all of this preposterous futures bit is the principles also called post-normal futures. Um, it relates to the first slide, the VUCA bit. So preposterous futures, post-normal futures are important because we're in a preposterous present and we're in the post-normal present already. And there's the one strong argument for why one has to look at the, at the crazy stuff as well. So um, there's, our, there's our little guy asking the librarian and I, before carrying on sort of more detailed fashion about weak signals, another really important point to make is, and sorry, this is also the font bleeding off the page. Um, and I know why. I originally made some of these slides, especially the ones that have pictures in them, I made on, a, on a, a, an Apple system. So this is why this is happening. I apologize. Um, it's incredibly important to realize that there, is, there aren't some futures that are better than other futures, or more correct, or um, the ones we should be working with, okay? All futures are equal, and, and futures are ambient. We, we are surrounded by futures, because futures exist in people's imaginations. They exist in our individual minds. And this is incredibly important for the African continent because there's this sort of knee-jerk automatic assumption reaction thing that, say, these are pictures of cities, by the way. So on the left-hand side, that's downtown Lagos, okay, and, and might very well still look like that in 2050. We, we don't know. And uh, anybody has it a guess? What's the picture on the right? I hear it there. It's Wakanda. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and the, these, are, these are equal. So the point is we need to develop the capabilities to work across that range of ambient futures. And speaking of cities, there's this knee-jerk reaction that is imported from um, the Googles of the world and um, from the West and nowadays from Southeast Asia and from Dubai, that if you have very tall skyscrapers and lots of glass and lots of concrete, and then, then you're a smart city, and, you know, and that, that means progress. And that's what, and you know, you've got to stop and say, no, no whoa, you know, let's treat some of these futures equally, and it's really important to figure out who it is that we're engaging with. So, um, checking our assumptions as well and making sure that we work with ambient futures. So here's the shopping list. Um, let me just, oh, and again, there we go. I've got all of them up now. Uh, the shopping list of kind of futures and strategic foresight tools and approaches. At the top, yes, you can all see that, great. At the top, scenario planning, that's the most common one. That's the one we work with most regularly. All right, and the most common version of the most common tool is the two by two uncertainty matrix. Um, and South Africa's got a really rich history of scenario practice and also of training um, futures and foresight practitioners that use scenario planning on, on really um, an ongoing basis. Um, and, and the typical uses of scenarios is to stress test your strategy, um, to um, make sure that you are incorporating risks that you otherwise wouldn't. Um, to sort of really focus on the key decision points, so it's a decision-making um, tool or, or a tool that assists you to make decisions. That's the most common use we see. But then going down that list, um, horizon scanning, it's in purple, because what I'm going to talk about, which is um, scanning for weak signals or merging issues analysis, falls under that horizon scanning thing. And horizon scanning is that sort of having the capability organizationally or within somebody in an organization that scans very, very broadly and looks at things outside of the organization in a structured manner, brings it in. There's some kind of decision-making framework for what counts as a signal of change, um, a scanning hit, and then incorporating that into decision making. So, but then just a little more, let me be a little bit more quicker, sense making. Um, 
is about being aware of how we engage with what it is we're looking at, uh, and particularly our biases. And there's some lovely work that's come out of Canada at the moment. The Canadian government has got a foresight um, unit called Policy Horizons, and they've done um, a piece of work on the future of sense making, looking at how our interaction and relationship with technology is changing the way we perceive things and make sense of things. Um, so, so really important stuff. Phase transition, those of you who are in the um, earth system science field or the ecology field will be very familiar with this. Um, it's around how change happens. So sometimes um, change is very cyclical. You know, history kind of doesn't really repeat itself, but there are patterns, cyclical change. Other times there's change that seems, it seems nothing happens forever, and then all of a sudden everything happens all at the same time. That's the phase transition bit. That's having an understanding. Uh, we like calling it punctuated equilibrium. Change happens very, very slowly um, because complex systems have a way of... Um, keeping themselves going and building up energy and building up connections until a tipping point, something triggers and that change happens very suddenly. So having an awareness of how change happens, important futures and foresight work, Experien experiential learning, and literally that's learning by doing, so immersive, uh, learning journeys for executives. Um, and South Africa's got some really interesting examples with this. Um, I, I come from Stellenbosch, so I guess I'm allowed to mention some of the Stellenbosch Mafia, um, but it's interesting, you hunt. <laughs> um, Johann Rupert is famous for, for um, getting on a plane, I mean, decades, years and years ahead of when something might develop into something, and going to see what this looks like. So, I mean... In the days, I think I was working for an oil company at the time and had a huge, big, clunky IBM desktop. Uh, and I think I was terribly proud because it had double disk drives or something to... <laughs> Come on, you remember these days. <laughs> anyway, um, Johann Rupert was famous in those days already for getting on a plane and going over to China and, and looking at... Um, um, production line of, of personal computers. And he was... Literally in those days, this is late 90s people, um, there was a production line somewhere in China um, that was a kilometer long. And, and St. Yang, of course, Becker is the other person, famous for taking time off, taking time away from the desk and going on an experiential learning journey. Red teaming. Um, Duarte, do, do you guys do some of this? Do you ever, when you sort of have decision, red teaming? In security work. In security work, yeah. General business and even NGO and NPO work. I mean, I'm working with a civil society organization that's red teaming now. They get to put together a little team um, that is specifically put together to say, well, sorry, this is wrong. We should be doing it like X, Y, and Z and purposely playing devil's advocate. Um, that kind of work. Serious gaming, design thinking. Design is incredibly important. I was listening to a talk the other day where somebody said everything is designed these days. I thought, okay, that's either helpful, very helpful, or very unhelpful, but anyway. And then experimentation and rapid prototyping. And again, the problem is, you know, when things are tight, when things are difficult, when things are volatile, that's precisely not the time when you're inclined to want to be experimental and prototypy. But that, of course, is precisely the time when you should be. So, let's do a little bit about scanning for weak signals. Um, firstly, just our cognitive biases, that when you scan for weak signals, it's impossible to get rid of our cognitive biases. We, I mean, we are so deeply pre-programmed, um, and, you know, anybody in, 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 in South Africa that, um, you know, even if people around the bri and say, I'm not a racist or whatever, um, and then, of course, that cognitive bias just kicks in hugely and say, oh, my goodness, yes, you are, but... Um, Probably not a clever thing to talk about. The point is, it's extremely difficult to get rid of, to completely lose, to completely reprogram your brain. But what you sure as hell can do is be aware. Be aware of your cognitive biases and park them. So get into that, Daniel Kahneman, slow thinking mode. 
when you start doing this kind of work. Now, I've listed three biases. There's whole long lists of them. I've listed three of these, and this is based on the work of Schumacher and Day. Paul Schumacher and George Day. It's an old article that appeared in the Harvard Business Review many years ago, um, sc scanning the periphery. Um, and they did some super work. And what they said, the strongest biases, especially for an organization that's attempting to pick up on what are weak signals of change, is groupthink. Groupthink, groupthink. And then, this is not just about what is being said, but also who says it. So if it's the big boss that says X, Y, and Z, the, the chance that you're going to think differently diminishes significantly, okay? And the who depends on so not just the big boss, but also maybe somebody that's been there for a very long time. Organizational politics. So, you know, sorry, this is unpopular to say it. We can't say things like this here. So really important to park those, be aware of them. And then this bias, of course, becomes stronger if information is weak, incomplete, ambiguous, or unquantifiable, and there you see VUCA again. So the more VUCA there is, the stronger these biases kick in. And, okay, this is not just me saying it. Um, this here is the evidence. Again, this is a study that was done quite some time ago um, by the um, IMD, the International Management... She forgets the acronym, sorry. Anyway, um, there is a reference for this if you're interested. Um, but just take a minute and, and, and just read um, this, this little list. It's, it's, it's quite frightening, to be honest. And my question is, of course, why is this so obviously a problem? If managers, senior executive people are answering this in a survey, they should be aware that... Anyway, so what is a weak signal? There's one definition. This is Schumacher and Day. Um, and the first symptom of change or a sign of an emerging phenomenon that may be significant. It may be significant. Okay. It's something that has actually already happened, but it's strange, it's weird, and ridiculous or scandalous. You know, again, that thing, oh, this is too, we can't talk about this, all right? That's where the weak signals are. And then this is a lovely, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's so nerve-wracking. I'll pose later, okay. <laughs> um, this is Hilton and who um, is famous um, in, in um, Finland for having done um, some really significant PhD work on the topic. A seem, seem, seemingly random, disconnected piece of information that at first appears to be part of background noise. And then it can be recognized, and often only with hindsight, to be part of a significant pattern. But you're able to spot it if you start viewing through different lenses or taking a different perspective on it, or, and I'll talk about crowdsourcing in a minute, start speaking to the people who think and see differently from what you do. That's when it starts becoming something that's meaningful. And then, um, that's me, I stuck that up there, and I want to talk about that just for a minute or two. And that is that what is often a weak signal to some is a mega trend to others. Yeah, okay, I hear, mm, and quite rightly so. Now, because, <laughs> You know, when COVID first hit um, and some of the conditions around COVID and then with the Ukraine war and, and the gas price crisis in Europe and all that sort of stuff, um, it, was very, it was fascinating. I was in a meeting with a bunch of um, Americans and Canadians. It, it was actually OECD people. And they were saying, oh my goodness, all these shocks and shocks. And, you know, we had the, the whole meeting was about shocks and something. And at some stage, a colleague of mine piped up, um, to African as well, piped up and she said, you know, actually, we're used to all that stuff. <laughs> These aren't, a lot of this isn't shocks for us. So she said, you know, maybe we should be talking about the democratization of shock, or we should be talking about the poly crisis. Um, and, and, and it's that. So what is, you know, what is a weak signal is blindingly huge, mega trend, obvious, depending on who you are and where you are. Okay. So just quickly, megatrends are these large-scale social, economic, political, environmental, technological changes. I said that very quickly, but here is the futures foresight rule of thumb always, steep V domains. 
S for social, T for technological, E for environmental, the other E for ecological, P for political, and V for values. Steep V. That's how broadly you look across domains. And that is why that is where we find these mega trends. Slow to form over decades. They take decades to form but which, once they've taken root, exercise a profound and lasting influence on many, if not most, human activities, processes, and perceptions. Now, one of the big megatrends that's going to shape the future of the planet is urbanization on the African continent. So, and I mean, so what, what until recently was a little bit of fringe part of academia is very quickly starting to become really, really important. But bioengineering, and that's why I was saying, you know, this is a mega trend. So it might seem weak signally in terms of some of the work that CSIR, I had, a, I had a walk around some of the exhibition space. It's fascinating. So I did some of my own weak signal scanning. Um, but demography, again, the planet getting older is not on our radar screens as much. But it is something that is fundamentally going to affect all our lives hugely. That's why that huge investment in robotics in Japan and Japan investing in robotics, trust me, it's going to spill over at some stage into our lives. And they're investing into robotics because the population's getting old, people aren't there to do the work. So it's those sort of spillover kind of effects. Um, here's a lovely example. Uh, it's a little, no, it's not too small, it's not too bad. This is an actual horizon scanning card. So doing some horizon scanning work, and, and I can tell you who this was for. This was for the Department of Agriculture in the Western Cape. During COVID and during lockdown and everything happened virtually, we did an enormous amount of work because the Department of Agriculture was wanting to look at future of agriculture and agri-processing and what other shocks were there potentially in the system. So part of the work, a very small part of it, was horizon scanning. And what's fascinating is here is a mega trend. The social transition, this shift in values from modern, modern values to post-materialist values. Now, this might seem weak signally to us, but it is huge. Half, so post-materialist values are young people, gender fluidity, um, autonomy, creativity, uh, self-expression, uh, you know, food blogging becomes the new normal. It's that kind of thing. You know, we think we don't pay attention to any of that and whatever. But what it does, it signals a huge shift in values with half of the population in rich countries already having, uh, by having these post-materialist values, okay? And what's interesting is when it kind of reaches halfway, that's the point at which the losers, people that have different opposing values, which value hierarchy and order and things like that more, um, that's when that, they sort of push back their hardest. So all of this stuff playing out, might not necessarily be on the radar of anybody here taking business decisions or um, making investment decisions or whatever. But if it is, it would be a weak signal from this perspective, but it actually is a mega trend. Um, I'll be a little bit quicker with the next one. Demographics, local, this is the Western Cape, basically saying that by 2040, which is all sooner than we think it is, Roughly 1 million out of 9 million people in the Western Cape, and this is taking migration into consideration, this is taking account of migration, is going to be over the age of 65. And what it's telling is that here in South Africa, we're going through, it's called the silver economy. There's a demographic dividend kicking in. Before people get so old that they start costing society money, they're able to, take, they're able to give back into society by paying taxes, of course, job Job creation is a huge issue. But the point is, um, we don't think of South Africans being an older economy and the benefits that come with that before it starts becoming um, a disadvantage. But, but we see this playing out in the Western Cape right now. Here, of course, are our um, really big mega trends. It's a little um, COVID cartoon. I think that was meant to be Manhattan at the time. And the cartoon was hacked. The cartoonist drew these three tsunami waves. Um, and then it was hacked and, and people went and drew the fourth one back in. And he said, it's cool and we, you know, everybody can use the picture <laughs> without having to um, ask his permission. 
Um, but the, the, the point is, it beautifully describes these mega trends and the tipping points. And the thing is, the weak signals are what you look for when you try and get a handle onto the tipping point. So when that thing crashes over, um, is, is what it is we should be searching for. Not the thing itself, but you've got to be very, very aware of the thing. And then, of course, this holds true. Is that, you know, we, we think we kind of are planned to set up for climate change. <laughs> yeah. But there are a lot of the sort of things scientists constantly tell us happening sooner rather than later, etc. And the reason, of course, behind all of these expected tipping points, polycrisis, intractable issues, underlying everything is this geological epoch that we're entering now, the Anthropocene. And if you haven't got that on your radar yet, please do so. We've had 10,000 years of human activity, the Holocene enabling us to produce food, to build cities, to multiply, spread all over planet Earth. And we've gotten to the stage where our human activity is now affecting planetary systems. And the scientists have now agreed on this. It's called the Anthropocene, and it fundamentally changes how we need to look at things, what it is we need to take seriously, what it is we need to make decisions about. Now, again, talk about tipping points, wild cards, black swans. How do we start getting a handle on them? I like to say we should think about them slightly differently. So instead of thinking, well, okay, this is uh, extremely low probability, extremely unpredictable, extremely high impact thing that may or may not happen, let's rather start thinking about them as predictable surprises. Um, and it is, it's the, if you think of a termite hill, and, 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 and the termites are migrating from the termite hill and start looking for other sources of food and they get to the table on the stoop, the wooden table, and they start chewing the table. Most people are not going to notice, unless you're the person that notices the little bits of dust, the termite dust on the stoop, but you're not going to notice because the stoop gets cleaned by somebody else every day. So these predictable surprises are there and we should get a lot better. And the little examples are really around that antimicrobial resistance. You know, all of this hand sanitizing, misuse of antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera, there is the next pandemic is one of antimicrobial resistance. That you're gonna get a normal pneumonia or a normal um, cut on the finger or something and, and want to take a, a, an antibiotic to fix that, as we've gotten so used to, and it just doesn't work anymore. And so, lovely book, I can really recommend that, Margaret Heffernan. She's got some great talks on YouTube as well, if you're interested. Um, so look her up, she did this willful blindness. Why do we ignore the obvious at our peril? Uh, that's the lifespan of concrete, okay? Co concrete has a lifespan, and you know, some of these things are just not. So the interplay of these, um, these predictable surprises, these tipping points, and these mega trends is beautifully depicted, and I'm sure you must have seen this before, the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Interconnection Map. And there they show the domains, the steep V domains, so social, technological, and everything. And this is an older one, but I quite like this one because it shows how if some of these things tip over, they trigger other things, and it has this cascading effect. And there's a lot of talk now with polycrisis. It's a word that's been used um, academically, intermittently, but it's now picking up speed and, and, and sort of becoming a bit more mainstream. But the point is this interplay and interconnectedness of things unfolding, these are risks, because remember, as much as we have risks unfolding, we also have enablers and catalyzers unfolding. Anyway, uh, weak signals give us an idea of where this might play out. Um, and, and that is what's so interesting. And again, just repeating a point of earlier, that these macro forces, what is a mega trend to one is a weak signal to another. So these macro forces play out on the global stage, but then they manifest locally and often quite differently. And it's up to us to start paying attention um, and, and, and getting information on, on how this happens. So. 
here we go. This is the absolute crux of it. Um, how do you do this? Uh, S-curve, futures people love S-curves. Um, take a minute or two, I'll be, I'll be quiet. Just take a minute or so just to read what's on the um, framework there. So here is where you're going to find weak signals and arguably in up there as well. So that's the zone there that you should be scanning and looking for. If you've read it in the Sunday Times on a Sunday morning, it's not a weak signal. Okay? By the time the government reacts, it's already ancient. But look at what it is you should be looking at. Art, science fiction, fringe writing, esoteric journals. And if you think, oh my goodness, this sounds terribly weird, trust me, in your organization, you have people working and around you. I mean, it's, if it's not your kids, it's your kids' friends or something like that. <laughs> that have this information, that are tuned into this. And I have, a, I have a colleague in, in the UK who says every time he takes a train journey, he walks into um, the station and he goes to the magazine rack and he buys a magazine from something that he, something that he obviously would never, ever normally buy. So, I mean, he lives in an apartment in London. He says he buys a gardening magazine. Um, and, and it sounds a little bit weird, but, but that's the kind of type of shift in thinking that one wants to... Here, research reports, think tank studies, scientific and technical journals. What's interesting, Twitter has been extremely useful, and I'm waiting with bated breath to see what happens with Twitter now that Elon Musk, can you see my pulling a face, um, has, has, has um, acquired it, um, because all of the sort of really interesting work at academic institutions um, where people are doing sort of experimental work, the fringe stuff, and people, people tweet. Um, they, you know, there's a talk about this or there's a blog, new blog post about that. And I have found Twitter extremely useful for following um, some of these sort of weird and wonderful things that are happening. So the point is to have a system and a structured way of figuring out what's happening here. And Duarte, we're going to talk and engage about that in just a little while, aren't we? Because uh, I know you've been doing some of this work. So um, very quickly, I'm nearly done. Uh, just to say here... Oh, this is the um, this is the the easy shortcut way of how you go about it, based on Schumacher and Day. So you know, where to look, but then how to do it. Tap local intelligence. Leverage your extended networks. Mobilize search parties. Take a decision to send let an executive go on an experiential learning journey. Crowdsource. Speak to the weird and wonderful bright young things in the company. Get them to start working on this. Sense making. There's, there's the role of scenarios again. Test multiple hypotheses. What if, what if, what if. Canvas the wisdom of the crowd. Develop diverse scenarios. And then probing and acting. Confront reality. That, that speaks to thee. Be aware of your biases. Park them. Work differently. Encourage constructive conflict. So red teaming, an example of that. And, but make it okay to start talking about those things that are difficult to talk about in the company. And trust seasoned intuition. This is, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay. Um, so there is institutional knowledge that is extremely valuable. So it's not just all about what's new, what's different, what's crazy. It is about combining and then sort of being able to get value out of what it is you're doing. So very quickly, this is um, our work that we do at um, Center for Sustainability Transitions called Seeds of a Good Anthropocene, because all this thing about this Anthropocene geological era, very dystopian, all bad news, all terribly frightening stuff. And what we did is we, start, we launched um, looking for what are seeds, bright spots of how things could work out. How can you have good levels of human development within planetary boundaries? 
And we've got a great collection of seeds. It's all on a website, www.goodanthropocenes.net. And seeds, are they're not widespread. They're not well-known. They're niche. Okay. In the social initiatives, projects, technologies, experiments. And we got a great, wonderful collection of these. And um, we developed a methodology where we combine them, mash them together, get people to imagine that that is the new normal. That's mature. They're not fringe. They mature. What does the world look like then? And that gave us a set of really superb um, um, scenarios. And then we used those scenarios to work backward, to say, well, what has to change? And that's the framework that we used for this. Um, so this is called Three Horizons Framework. It's superb to work with because our, the weak signals, the seeds, um, the signals, the pockets of the future in the present are at the bottom right here. Oops, sorry, uh, but I might as well bring, okay. Here we go, weak signals. It's not dominant. So it's at the bottom, but they indicate that third horizon. Uh, these horizons, people are not timelines. They're just an indication of how systems shift. So a dominant system is dominant until such time it isn't anymore, all right? And difficult to call because of tipping points. And a nascent system, a system that's wanting to develop, is niche until in the future somewhere it's dominant and then things look completely different. The, the best way to um, remember this, by the way, or to think about this is a really super um, framework to use for nearly anything. It's very intuitive as well. Um, is uh, the energy transition that we're going through at the moment. So up here, fossil fuel, oil, and the system around it, internal combustion engines, um, political power, enormous amounts of money, etc., fighting like mad to remain dominant. Here on the up, renewable energy, solar, wind, sort of really growing very quickly. The transition zone is where these things clash, where you'd have a very big change happening here, for example, is if subsidies shift. So fossil fuels still get trillion dollar subsidies. If those subsidies shift, it enables that shift. It's one of the things, of course, one can have many conversations about this. But look here, down here, that's not renewable energy. Weak signals, that's stuff like fusion, okay? Fusion power maybe arguably green hydrogen. So that's the, you know, that's the stuff here. It's not on the up there. Um, but there's a lovely framework for having structured strategic conversations about this. Um, this is just illustrative to say small things, tipping points. And the way to get a better handle on tipping points is to get a handle on weak signals, which is why we do it. And I'm ending off, and I'm going to leave it up there for just a little bit, um, the generic benefits of this way of thinking. And we've got a good 20 minutes or so for engagement and conversation. Uh, let's just take another minute to finish reading that. I'm not going to read it for you. Everybody done? Oh, these slides are available, by the way, as well. So, and the uh, questions and comments and conversation be most welcome. And that is a complicated system, not a complex system. But uh, <laughs> training a pilot to have a take off at an airport, being a passenger, going through the security system, flying the thing from one country to another over time zones, that's a complex system. But this in itself, complicated. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Uh, so I'd like to take some questions. I don't know whether there are any burning questions immediately. Um, don't see any immediately. Uh, so Tanya, um, I, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, perhaps uh, if, if you wouldn't mind going back uh, a few slides. Um, you're welcome to stay seated there. You don't have to go back. Oh, of course. I can, you can operate. You can look over there, you. yes. You can, you can look relaxed and um, I'll, I'll walk around and you know, solicit questions. Um, you can just okay. remain calm and relaxed. 
So if we just go back um, <clears throat> uh, just a little bit further on um, there. That one. Uh, the next one. That one. So I, I, I saw you covered my, um, because my experience, if we go back, sorry, just to go back to the previous one. Um, so one of the problems um, that I've experienced working, um, doing this, is that people think they've got something which is an emerging signal, but they just haven't read the literature. It's like 30 years old. And then they get very upset with me in a, in a workshop because I say, well, that's not an emerging issue. It's actually a trend or it's a problem already. It's been well known for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you covered that. But if we go to the next slide. Um, so if I look at this, one of the things that's um, interesting, um, and I know this is just a schematic, but maybe you could, um, and this is a question to you. In moving from scanning for weak signals to sense making, um, it seems to me like there's an important step there of opening up the implications of these emerging signals. What sorts of methods and techniques would you use to do that before we start, in, you know, getting into, and maybe that's part of it's in that transition between the scanning and getting into the sense making. So there's some preparatory work that you do there before you do these kinds of things. Perhaps you'd like to talk to that. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. I I'm biased. Um, <laughs> So I, I really like something called a futures wheel, um, which is um, really easy, very useful. I'm so sorry, I can't see people over there now, but I think I had good eye contact with you uh, while I was talking. Tanya, you've got the mid middle oh, seat here. Okay. Um, um, I feel safer yeah. in the corner. <laughs> okay, oops, I'm sorry. They're a different height. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Um, uh, futures wheels are fantastic. Yes. So if you've got something that is a weak signal or an emerging trend or, or whatever, um, so let's take something like uh, fusion power, for example. So you've done your research, you've had a look at you know, the timeline of when people think this might actually be a reality has become less and less, um, and you've done your research and you say, well, you know, it's still, this is still crazy stuff, and... Um, fusion power, it's also, there. oh my goodness, look, there's some people experimenting with the fact that it might be actually affordable, not the most expensive thing ever thought of humankind. And then what you do is you put that notion of fusion power in the middle of a sort of bullseye kind of um, graphic. And you say, um, this is a possibility, fusion power. And then you go through a process of saying, well, what if, what are the implications and the consequences of this actually b moving out of weak signal territory? Becoming real. What, what would be the Correct. Of that, politically or economically? Precisely. Precisely. So your futures wheel technique is all about, here's this weak signal, um, and let's have to, a talk about it's not niche or marginal anymore. What does it cause and then steep V, hmm? social, technological, economic, environmental, political values. What if, what happens, what's the consequence, what's the implication, what's the impact? And then you've got a kind of a ring going around. We use hexagon stickies for this, they're great. Got a nice big hexagon sticky. You pack a ring of these big stickers around it with this information. And you don't stop there, you carry on. You say, well, if you've got, this is the social implication and consequence of fusion power becoming a reality, and you've got an answer there that people have brainstormed, what's the implication of that? And you unpack a second and third, these concentric rings, think of a dartboard or a bullseye kind of target. So that's a great technique. Um, and then Duarte sense making takes time and it takes effort and it takes conversation, and it takes multiple perspectives. It's not something you can't just, you know, get people, because that, there's always in the organization going to be people saying, oh, you know, that's crazy stuff, or it's, uh, you know, <laughs> what you, I, I had a manager once um, who said, Tanya, I'm not paying you a fancy salary to sit behind a computer and surf for things that are blah, 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 and then, you know, that was the end of me doing scanning work. Is there anybody else that has got experience Questions. There we go. Um, yeah, I just have a question. Thanks, Tanya. Um, 
exactly on the issue that you raised now. Um, how do we then organizationally and even outside the organization create buy-in once these weak signals have been detected? And uh, with regards to the previous slide, uh, um, the late responders, uh, uh, like for example, government, how do you bring them closer to the ripples when, when you start sensing them? Um, you know, there's always going to be some people that never get it. Um, but I'm hoping the structure of the slides that I gave you, the, the fact we're in a VUCA world, you need different ways of thinking and doing. Futures thinking and having a sense of complexity is one of them. And so that whole argument. Um, COVID has helped a lot. Um, I don't have to explain to people why it's important <laughs> to have some kind of mechanism to better anticipate shocks and surprises. COVID answered that for me. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a mixture of that argument, that angle. Um, it's also very important to let people understand thinking about the future and having imaginaries and ideas is actually quite normal. It's a human activity. You know, it's not some kind of new, fancy new corporate science. It isn't that. And that, and then that shopping list at the, at the very end, those generic benefits of futures and foresight. Um, you know, it's got to be like that picture I showed of the blindfolded executives. They know, they know. Um, so if, if you've got a set of sort of answers and saying here, this is how to go about it. And we're lucky in South Africa, we've got many practitioners. We've got good practitioners that know their stuff. Um, yeah, but if, the, if there was a magic formula, I'd have it and, you know, wave the wand and make everybody more futures literate, but okay. Okay, are there any more questions? Yes, yes. I see one there. Oh, yeah. oh there, yes, please. Okay, um, in one of your slides, thank you very much for the talk, it was actually beautiful. Um, in one of your uh, slides, you highlighted the, demographic, the de demographics, um, that currently there are so many old age population, but in the, in the near future, the, the, that number will increase. And then you said uh, Japan is, in, is in investing in robotics to respond to that. So my question now comes... I, and I'm so sorry, if you don't just speak up a little bit. I'm saying uh, you highlighted earlier on on, uh, on, on the demographics. Uh, that means the population of the, of the old age, over 65. Ah, the, yeah. yeah, that is so much. It was 297 something, right? I think the number was like that. Then I didn't get the... the, the but the, it was a bigger number in the, in the near future of that population. So now, you said uh, Japan is res uh, responded to that by investing much on robotics, and you also highlighted that that will be part of us as well in Africa, or maybe the world. So uh, I was saying, is that the 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 the, 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 the best solution for the situation, or is there any other way we can attend to that? Uh, why I'm asking that um, is that. Um, we have uh, uh, emerged from one industrial revolution to the next. Mm -hmm. And now today we are suffering from uh, cl global uh, uh, climate change, I would say. Um, global warming, I would say, mm -hmm. because we, did, we ignored some signals at, in the second and the third industrial revolutions. So now in the fourth and the fifth industrial revolution, are we doing something to, uh, to avert uh, dangers that could, we could face like we are now facing global warming because we ignored some yeah. things that, in, that happened in the second and the third industrial yeah. revolutions. Yeah, um, everything you've mentioned there is absolutely huge and unfolding in, in this, um, in, in this um, transition zone right there now. And it literally, the, the point about transition zone, it's messy. There's a battle there about what are the technologies? Um, what is the impact of those technologies? What is the consequence and effect that they're going to have? And it's all fighting out in messiness. But the point is we need to be able to have good conversations about what are the different implications of, given we've got climate change coming, what are the, tech, you know, the fourth and fifth industrial revolution issues, unpacking them, and again, having a strategic structured conversation about the future so that we're able to take those better decisions about which other technologies we should be backing and which not. I, I tend to be, I hope I've interpreted your, 
question correctly. I tend to be um, I tend to be an optimistic South African because um, we're lucky in that we have quite an open society. Uh, there aren't terribly sort of hard-baked ideas about this is exactly the way we should be going. Um, there, there is a lot of um, contestation of ideas about, hang on a minute, um, you know, this is not the smartest idea to kind of um, stretch out the coal as long as possible, et cetera, or whatever. Um, and these ideas and contestations um, make up part of the conversation that we have. The point is, and that's the point of the Anthropocene, um, and again, the VUCA thing, is we really are hitting planetary boundaries where all bets are off, literally. Um, and the biggest challenge we have on the African continent is our levels of human development. And it's that fine sort of, it, if you think of human development, we need a minimum level of human development. And, and now, now that's not the overconsumption stuff, okay? This is, that doesn't mean we should all now be like, like the Americans and have huge trucks and massive air conditioners and, and things like that. So levels of human development, there's a boundary for that, and then there are these planetary boundaries. And there's that ring of innovation. And in a place like South Africa, that innovation comes from the messy edges. That innovation is not going to come from established systems that have been there for a long time and are kind of locked into the ways of doing things, locked in economically, locked into where power lies, locked into where decisions get taken. We're at the messy edge. Um, and, and in that tri kind of transition zone. Um, so, so that's the kind of the point I'm trying to make. Is, is I feel optimistic that there are ways of addressing the complexities that, that you are describing okay. there. I saw somebody's hand over there. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, I think that the concept of future studies and future thinking is always very intriguing. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on two things, really. The one is on, on the slide that we see. Um, where would you, just your views, where would you plot South Africa uh, if we had to uh, choose a quadrant? And then secondly, um, I'd like you to hopefully dispel the myth that futures thinking or future studies is reserved for more affluent economies. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really the, the conundrum that us, uh, and I hate the phrase, but if I can just coin it, the third world countries are grappling with, with the global shortage of resources and supply. Yep. Um, the whole concept of future studies is just seen to some extent as a, if, you know, as pie in the sky or something you do after you've resolved, um, you know, yep. immediate challenges on the ground. So. Um, yeah, Future so just, studies is a luxury. Yes, that's okay. it, exactly. So I'd love your thoughts on that, and thanks once again. Okay. Um, where we place South Africa on that three horizons framework depends what the question, what is the question that you're asking. Um, if it, so, so if South Africa is your unit of analysis, what, what bit of it are you looking at? Because so, uh, I was trying to understand maybe if uh, we had to plot South Africa or rate South Africa in terms of its level of maturity, uh, assuming uh, we are still operating in the, in the present domain or in the transition, or are we almost yep. bordering the, the future uh, horizon? Yep. Where, where would we plot ourselves? It, it depends entirely what your idea, and remember it's different from other people's idea, what your ideas of what is a considered a mature future. So is it some kind of vision of uh, liberal democracy um, and, and capitalist economy where you know, individuals all have um, great levels of consumption? Yeah, and, or is it some kind of um, autocratic, semi-autocratic system like Singapore? You know? so, so if you put Singapore in the top right there, uh, where's South Africa compared to Singapore? So it depends what it is you're looking at. We often work within a future third horizon. You can either stick scenarios in there or you can stick a preferred future. The one thing that's really interesting again, and, and it kind of links, and my answer to your second question is also going to link 
to um, what I said to the gentleman um, in, in the back in the middle there. Um, South Africa's messy, very messy. So I think we are smack in that transition zone, um, unsure of where it is we're headed, which raises the really important issue of why future studies or future literacy is incredibly important and not just an elite or business or military exercise. It really needs civil society and everybody's voices to be heard about what kind of community and country do we want to become? And then have that conversation of, well, what is it that needs to decline? What is it that needs to grow? What is it that we need to navigate, transition in that, in that messy middle? So in a way, your question to me about where South Africa is, my answer to you is futures literacy for everybody uh, becomes so critically important. And it becomes, it really is about all voices being heard Again, South Africa has got some enormously superb work. Um, it's become a loaded term, but decolonizing the future, having conversations about, no, it isn't just about reaching some kind of capitalist growth um, target or, or human development targets, and, and then after that, no consequences or something. And... I would, and, and the chair at Stellenbosch University, precisely transformative futures means this is not regular futures planning, strategic foresight. It all is, is all about transformative futures. It means crossing that bridge to what is ultimately or should become a sustainable society where people can have a good life and not some people a fantastic life and others a really horrible life. I've been a bit fluffy and vague with you, um, but... Those are critical, fundamental questions, which for me answer themselves by saying we should all be engaging in, in futures work. And, and it's very empowering to do so. But yeah, I hear you, you know, the fancy stuff and the, the little videos and the things you see tend to come from uh, if, if, if we take futures as um, a way of solving tomorrow's problems today, then it's not a luxury. If I can offer that as an explanation, yeah. it's not a luxury. Um, it's not about just imagining some um, utopian future. It's actually about solving tomorrow's problems the, today. The and gentleman a really has a huge point, though, Duarte, because I've just come back from the Dubai Futures Forum. And in a, so Dubai two weeks ago gathered um, the world's top 400 futurists or whatever, and it was all glitz and all glamour. It was fantastic, by the way, to just be out and engage with other futures people. And they came from all over, you know. And in Singapore, it, it happens in the prime minister's office. Uh, same thing, sure. you know. Yeah. And, um, so, and Salesforce is a massive company. They've got a, a futures foresight chief executive, you know, C, C level person appointed, but. Part of that conversation was also um, people from Zimbabwe that are starting a, a, a course at the Technicon there in strategic foresight. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but, I mean, academically and intellectually and principally and morally, I fall very strongly into the camp of it is precisely not for the elite to make those calls. And, and, and we have a, we have a, you've got to have that kind of mutually assured diversity when you do futures work. Otherwise, you're doing bad futures work. Um, and you know what they call it? You used future. Yep. Yeah, if you, the Suhail in your tool term. Yep. You're working with a used future like a used car. So if you think progress and future and ideal wonderfulness is Singapore, it's been used up already. It's a used future. Or, or it doesn't translate into our particular context, context that would yeah. make it a used future. But I think we've hit the end of the time. Oh, uh, I'd like to thank okay. you very much, Tanya. Sorry. And um, for all your effort. Oh, super. Do I get a goodie bag? Yes, you I do. Goodie. We won't disappoint you on this one. Thank regard. you, thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for your time and effort. Okay. And